want to go uh, to another part of New York now where Garrick Utley is for his thoughts about this terrible day. Garrick, some perspective for us, will you? Well, the perspective is the very painful reality, Colleen, as we've been seeing all day and now into the evening. It's said, of course, that New York City is the city that never sleeps. And never has that been more true than on this evening or actually now in the early morning hours of the day after, except the pain still reverberates here through the entire city. It's strange around her. It's dark. Of course, it's the void of night. And yet there's this eerie quiet, not just downtown where people are not allowed to go past police barriers, but here in Midtown, the streets are empty. Times Square normally jammed with people in traffic at this hour, coming out of theaters or restaurants or movies. Uh, there, there's nobody there. I was coming down Fifth Avenue tonight on a bus, the only way to get around town. Uh, nobody there. Uh, Manhattan, of course, is an island, and in the way this, this island has now pulled up its drawbridges, uh, at least, uh, if not literally, metaphorically. Uh, the tunnels in and out of town, the Lincoln Tunnel and the uh, Holland Tunnel have been closed to traffic. The bridges are closed to vehicular traffic. Only the George Washington Bridge has one lane open uh, for outgoing traffic, nothing coming inbound. But to give you an idea of how jittery people and police are here, uh, bomb squads are everywhere, racing around the, uh, the city, checking out every suspicious vehicle. In fact, one on the George Washington Bridge are trying to approach the George Washington Bridge was stopped and searched. They thought they had something there. It turns out to have been a false alarm. But everybody is working 24 hours uh, through this evening. Let's look again at some of the scenes we had today. Uh, what we've gone through here in, in Manhattan is really four stages. First, there was the terror of the attack. Uh, We've been seeing these all day long. The pictures speak for themselves, the rubble that is there. The two planes, one at 8.45 a.m., 18 minutes later, the second jet plowing into the, the uh, those giant towers at the lower end of Manhattan. And, and, and scenes like this, not just on the street, but in buildings, places where people worked in stores there. There are the mannequins covered with dust, and of course, the people covered with dust. And right after this initial terror came more of the aftermath. Um, the, the survivors, uh, the people being hauled out, uh, traumatized, wounded, people trying to get in touch with their loved ones, a great jostling to get to public telephones to call home to tell their loved ones that, that they were safe, if they were among the fortunate few uh, who were safe on this day. And then, of course, came the job of taking those who could be taken to hospitals. Uh, hospitals are, are jammed here. Uh, at least 1,500 people, um, according to the latest official reports, um, uh, have been taken into hospital. More than 2,000 are being treated or have been treated in triage centers set up around town, including the, uh, the Statue of Liberty in, in New York City Harbor. Uh, Mayor Giuliani, uh, as other officials, is not even trying to give an estimate of the death toll, but he did say, quote, when we get the final numbers, they will be more than we can bear. He said it's horrendous the number of lives lost. For example, 300 policemen, perhaps even more, are missing and feared lost in the collapse of the towers. And, um, and, Garrick, and that's Garrick, just, if yes. I can, let me interrupt you. This is Jim yes. Clancy. Let me just interrupt you for a minute Please. because we have a new piece of footage that has come in that gives us another perspective, yet another perspective of the tragedy as it was literally unfolding this day, showing that second plane from a different angle as it slammed into the... That was they were uh, rewinding the tape there, but an incredible angle showing that plane as it came in very low. You could see how low it was. Apparently, there from Battery Park, taking a look. Uh, can we roll it again, please? We've seen it from the front angle before, but not from this angle. Eric Utley, I, I want to ask you something. As we look at these pictures, and we've looked at these pictures over and over again, and it affects not just the people that are in the United States that have been there in New York, but literally all around the world. Buildings, yes, they can be rebuilt, but there seems to be something in the psyche that may have been changed by the events of this day, such as the magnitude of what we've witnessed. There's no question about this, Jim. Uh, whether you're here in Manhattan and, and you saw that as an eyewitness or whether you're on the opposite side of this world watching it via satellite at this moment, it's not, they're never the same pictures. Each one is this new experience again, whether we're just seeing the same 
picture two or three times or something new like that. And I'm sure more pictures and images will be coming from various sources in the hours and the, and the days to come. What, what really strikes you, though, and I think strikes any journalist or any, any person down on the street, is, is not just what we saw with that plane going into that tower and the horror of it, but trying to think, each of us, throughout this day, what were the people in that plane going through? Who was in that tower where those flames and smoke are right now, having their morning coffee in a styrofoam cup, looking out across beautiful New York Harbor on a cloudless day and seeing this jet? Nothing more to say, just watch. Nothing more to say, except just one detail, of which I think has been reported, but I might offer some clarity, Jim and Colleen. That was the second plane that uh, struck the trade of the t uh, towers. It came from the south over New York Harbor, which is the normal direction the planes approach for landings at LaGuardia Airport. Planes coming into Kennedy don't fly over Manhattan. Planes coming into LaGuardia do fly up the Hudson River on this side or the East River on that side. So a plane coming from the south, you'd say he's off course, but that's the way planes do make their approach. But that first plane at 8.45 this morning, it came from the other direction. It was going up a one-way street, so to speak. It came from the north, which is here, straight down over the center of Manhattan into that tower. We saw that image uh, just a few minutes ago. So it was going against traffic. Everybody who looked up and caught a glimpse of that plane flying at hundreds of miles of hour in Manhattan knew instantly something was wrong. That plane had no business being there, but well, it was, and well, that's the result. Garrick, it's awful and, and it's horrendous is what, what this country has seen, what the world has seen already today. I suppose come daylight tomorrow when day starts breaking uh, behind you there, it starts to get really grim, doesn't it? Because people may get a, a better sense of the devastation, a better sense of the toll in terms of human life. Well, we don't know when officials will start to make any kind of an estimate on uh, how many lives have been lost. The search, of course, will begin. Uh, it's going to be long and arduous because we've seen how much rubble is down there, and nobody's even guessing how long it'll take to go through the rubble. One way of approaching a figure of uh, human loss will be by taking a survey or an inventory, a census, if you will. Um, each company, each floor had offices, companies, uh, people working there. They know how many employees were there. They know who didn't come home. That's the kind of, of statistics, the numbers, the body count, sad to say, that'll be made starting tomorrow morning. Back to you. Garrett Cutley, thanks. Thanks for that, Garrett.